a warm welcome from the Africa Center to our alumni, colleagues, and partners from over 50 countries across Africa. We have registered uh, to attend today's webinar, uh, The Fourth Industrial Revolution and Africa's Security Landscape. My name is Dr. Nate Allen, and I am the Assistant Professor of Security Studies and the Africa Center's faculty lead on cyber issues. Before we continue with our program, it is my honor to briefly turn things over to our director, Amanda Dory, to say a few brief words about the Africa Center. Amanda, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, bonjour, bon dia. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Amanda Dory. I'm the new director of the Africa Center as of one month ago today. And it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to participate in a webinar for the first time since arriving. Just a few brief words of greeting before we dive into a very meaty topic today. I'd just like to refresh all of you, uh, alumni and partners, about what, what we think we're doing here at the Africa Center, what, what our mission is. We're focused on advancing African security in four pathways. The first one is expanding understanding. The second one is to be a trusted platform for dialogue. The third is to build and sustain partnerships. And fourth, and truly importantly, is catalyzing strategic solutions. I think we see all four elements coming together today in this webinar format. One of the silver linings of COVID has been the as a driver of innovation and along with many, many organizations and institutions that has caused us to explore technology solutions and to innovate in the form of these webinar series. We're very pleased to be able to continue those even as we begin to return to some in-person events. The beauty of the webinar is it allows us to pull people together from all over in a single place and, and single format and iterate and learn from one another. I'm very pleased that we're tackling this topic today in terms of the fourth industrial revolution and the implications for African security and United States security uh, together. So with that, I would just encourage you, if you haven't done so recently, please check the africacenter.org website. We have new research and publications coming out all the time on this topic that we're addressing today, as well as many others. And let me now turn it back over to Dr. Nate Allen. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Amanda, for that excellent introduction. Um, on the, the point about the webpage, I have just sent everyone a link to the program's webpage in the chat. There you will find our speaker bios and a reading list. And then in a couple of weeks, the, the recording for this program. So the reason why we are having this webinar is that many of the world's leading technologists and futurists are becoming convinced that the digital digital revolution may only be the beginning of an even more fundamental series of technological changes. This so-called fourth industrial revolution will be driven by overlapping innovations in digital, biological, and materials sciences. Some of the key technologies driving this fourth industrial revolution include advances in artificial intelligence, robotics, genetic engineering, 3D printing, and nanomaterials. Over the coming decades, the fourth industrial revolution may drastically alter global, man global manufacturing and reshape balances of power. To date, very little has been written or discussed about this fourth industrial revolution's likely impact on Africa, and even less on its security implications, which are likely to be profound and frankly, are already starting to be felt. Across the continent, drastic reductions in commercial satellite technology are contributing to rapid advances in intelligence collection and being used to address food security and climate change. The United Nations alleges that the world's first autonomous weapon was used on African soil in March 2020 when a Turkish-made Cargo 2 military drone was reportedly used, reportedly used machine learning object classification algorithms that are AI driven to target logistics networks belonging to the Libyan National Army without 
direct human oversight or intervention. And in the future, possibly the near future, a proliferation of small, smart, and cheap weapons platforms may provide smaller plowers and even non-state actors with capabilities that today are the preserve of superpowers. So what is this fourth industrial revolution and how does it relate to cybersecurity, a topic that many in our audience I think are more familiar with? What are the geopolitical and security implications for Africa with respect to the spread and proliferation of fourth industrial revolution technologies? How can African security sector officials and government stakeholders work together to enhance the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution and mitigate the downsides, risks, and information security challenges associated with it? While it will only be possible to scratch the surface of the answers to these important questions over the next hour, it is my hope that you all come away with this webinar convinced of the fourth industrial revolution's significance for global and for African security. And to help us illuminate the scope and the scale of the security challenges from this revolution, I'm really honored to introduce two extremely distinguished panelists. Uh, first, we have with us Dr. Landry Signier, who is executive director and professor of the Thunderbird School of Global Management, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and a distinguished fellow at Stanford University. He is a world-renowned expert on the challenges, opportunities, and strategies for addressing Africa's emerging technology challenges, and has been recognized by the World Economic Forum as one of the top 50 most future-oriented thought leaders. He is also the founding director of the Fourth Industrial Revolution and Globalization 4.0 Initiative, so we're really going to benefit from his expertise. Next, we have with us Ms. Modiehi Makumane, who is a researcher with the Security and Technology Program at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, where she focuses on cybersecurity and the implications of emerging technology for developing countries. Before joining the United Nations, Molehi was with the South Africa's Department of International Relations and Cooperation, where she led the International Cybersecurity File and served as a negotiator at the high-level open-ended working group and as a senior advisor to the UN government group of experts. You may also recognize her from Foreign Policy Magazine, where she was profiled among people to know in securing our digital future. So we're absolutely delighted to have both of you with us today for this webinar. And Landry, I, I wanna start with you to help get us a broad sense of what the, what the fourth industrial revolution is and, and what some of its implications are. So I imagine there are many in our audience who were a bit unfamiliar with the concept. So what is the fourth industrial revolution and what are the key technologies behind it? And what role does information technology play as part of the fourth industrial revolution? And how might it go, it, it relate to and go beyond the domain of, of cybersecurity, which I think is a bit more familiar to, to many of our audience today. Bonjour et merci beaucoup, uh, Nate. Hello, and thank you so much, Nate, for your very warm introduction. I would like to thank the Africa Center for uh, hosting us today and thank all the audience. So in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, it is a theme that has emerged during the last decade, when we hear questions of digitalization, often there is confusion between what is the third industrial revolution, which is digitalization and the acceleration of it, and the fourth re industrial revolution, which is defined by the executive president of the uh, global forum as being a fusion, a combination of technologies that brings together, that kind of uh, brings together the physical, biological, and digital worlds. So the fourth industrial revolution is based, is founded on the third industrial revolution, which is very linked to the question of digitalization. But the fourth revolution is much more complex. Uh, first off, 
there is the question of the 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 breadth and the reach of the fourth industrial revolution the scope all of these sectors are affected nobody can really be uh, cut themselves off from the fourth industrial revolution um, and to even try to be excluded from it would have a strong impact on persons the persons who are trying who are uh, protecting themselves uh, uh, in terms of cybersecurity or other and also the fourth industrial revolution is truly uh, uh, characterized by the speed of the innovation its innovation uh, when there were new technologies a hundred years ago it took several decades or even a century to to become popularized and but today these technological innovations are popularized like in almost real time when we speak of twitter facebook and other or speaking of drones, for example. And the fourth important characteristic feature of the um, industrial, this fourth revolution is the impact, the holistic impact that it has on systems, whether they be government systems, economic systems, political systems, and their efficiency and ability to, to to do what we call design thinking, uh, to look, focalize, focus on specific press questions very specifically uh, to laser focus uh, issues, issues um, and within different security sectors. So these are a few broad uh, uh, points uh, to, to bring to you the main uh, characteristics. It's a fusion technology. We don't just speak of artificial intelligence. We don't just speak of one of physical issues or, or, or others, but in a certain way, we speak of features also bi biological, for example, how we are interconnected on the earth. So the question is, what are some of the key technologies of the fourth industrial revolution? Of course, there are technologies such as artificial intelligence, which is well known at this point. There's, of course, uh, technologies such as drones, uh, uh, automatic vehicles, blockchain biotechnology, the speed with which, for example, we discovered uh, the, the vaccine for COVID-19. And this is also linked to, to these technologies that have emerged with the fourth in, uh, industrial revolution. It's not an abstract issue. It's very concrete. When you're talking about drones, uh, be they used for security in the Sahel region to fight against Boko Haram or others, in, or in Nigeria, in Chad, in Cameroon, in Niger, Mali, among other countries, or be uh, it used for medical issues uh, in Rwanda, for example, to deliver um, drugs to patients to uh, or medical equipment in rural areas to face issues that come up with infrastructure. This is all part of the concrete applications of these technologies that are issued from this, that have come out of this fourth industrial revolution. A few uh, years ago, there was, we, we were looking at uh, to what extent um, African countries were vulnerable. Now, the, these tests that were carried out showed that in, in, a, in a matter of minutes or, or even um, hours, uh, internet sites uh, were shown to be, and this, these be, you know, uh, sites of ministries or uh, government or key infrastructures that might be linked to water, energy, hospitals. It, it was shown that these websites could be attacked uh, within minutes or hours and could come under the control of nefarious forces in, in a record amount of time. 
So the fourth industrial revolution is offering incredible tools for security, you know, and, and for cybersecurity. But on the other side, this means that this digital exposure means that evildoers could very quickly attack infrastructures, be they physical or security infrastructure or digital infrastructure. And this is why it is so important to establish a balance between the phenomenal potential that, that is present in, in terms of economics development, uh, societal development. But we also have to, to establish this balance with the risks that are, uh, that are presented by the uh, bad use of, of this revolution, you know, for example, to control the results of elections that are now taking place e electronically, uh, digital attacks, uh, attacks against economic infrastructure, etc. So this fourth industrial revolution uh, provides us with a phenomenal potential uh, for the, and that's a potential for the continent, the African continent, and be it at the economic level or security level. But the other side of the coin is that there are immense risks that are associated with this. So I will stop here and we can maybe yeah. no, go you. further that's, into that's it. That's a really good uh, point to make. So I think, you know, I, I really liked how you know, your, your definition of the fourth industrial revolution is being linked to really the increasing physical effects of the digital revolution and, and MRA vaccines being a really, mnRNA vaccines being a really good example of how basically artificial intelligence is, in, is informing the development of vaccines of unprecedented effectiveness that are then being, being you know, farmed out to the world. You're seeing this in, in many, many fields. So, so it's clear, and as you said at the very end of your, your remarks, that, that the fourth industrial revolution has some potentially incredible benefits associated with it, but, but also some risks. So if you could talk in your view, what are some of the most significant benefits and what are some of the most significant risks? Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Now, several benefits of this fourth industrial revolution can be particularly if you are thinking about developing countries. So one of the benefits is really this, uh, this encouragement towards economic development and the structural transformation of the country. For example, one of the things we do at the Brookings Institute it's, is we analyze the emergence of new industries, which we call uh, smokeless industries, which which are closely linked to uh, the IT sector and, and information technologies, essentially. And why these industries are important? They're important because when you look at the traditional manufacturing sector, experts will talk about the deindustrialization of Africa. But when you look at these new industries, the exports in these industries have been six times quicker than those in traditional industries. It's a second thing to note is that these industries linked to the emerging of technologies are also uh, uh, more important in, in many ways uh, than the traditional industries. They share uh, some qualities, their exportability, for example. Uh, and then significant product production and their ability to absorb a significant number of workers uh, who had moderate a moderate level of qualifications and then of course it has a, an impact on poverty some studies have shown that M-Pesa, the arrival at M-Pesa in Kenya, reduced poverty by about 2%. So it's really clear that this emergence of technologies that address specific problems make it bring about positive impacts on the economies of, of the countries. Now, that is one dimension. So, you know, increased economic growth, an increase in the structural transformation, um, integrate a greater integration of workers into the formal economy. There's also the aspect of the fight against poverty. I, I talked about M-Pesa and the impact of 
that that produced, but there are other uh, digital technologies that can really provide uh, the, the to the uh, most underprivileged people can have access to information, can find employment, and can improve uh, their uh, life standards, their quality of life. There's, of course, the Internet of Things, blockchain. These, all of these, can have this ability to increase um, this, you know, collection of data that allows us to analyze poverty and to have much more targeted specific interventions to fight against it. So we can talk about social services that are now and, and uh, many things that are uh, delivered in a mobile manner. The third impact is really the invention or the reinvention of what work is, what is the future of work, the uh, capacity to produce. Now, within a decade, I think Africa will have the potential, will have this, uh, you know, potential number of, of workers, but, you know, and they will be one of the biggest markets at the at world level. So it will be very important to be, to have created an alignment and to that the capacities that are developed are in line with the work of the future, the labor of the future. Now, there is also the increase in services, be they financial or investment services, with the uh, connection that is uh, everywhere now. In the 1990s, New York, um, had more uh, phone lines than the entire continent. But now we have, you know, many, many people um, who subscribe to this. And so it, it makes it much easier to have these mobile payment um, applications. Then there's the development of uh, technologies in agriculture and many other things that can help uh, with water, uh, fertilizer supply, all these items that uh, come into play when we talk about the changes in temperatures. So the work that is done by farmers, for example, you know, uh, the analysis of the soil, the mapping, you know, if you use drones to uh, observe uh, farm land is one example. I published a paper recently about the revolution's role in improving health and, and human capital. So we've seen an acceleration in the processes with applications that enable doctors to monitor patients in rural areas, uh, applications that uh, deal with insurance, so it is clear that the potential of the fourth industrial revolution is absolutely phenomenal and, and impacts pretty much all sectors of the economy, but the risks, and not only in terms of security, have to do with governance as well. Leaders now have access to an incredible amount of information regarding their citizens, if they are democratic leaders and have responsible behavior, this is very good. But if they're not democratic leaders and do not eat, uh, act in a responsible manner, there are uh, there's an incredible amount of tension or information in the data that can be used to incriminate uh, citizens to or to control the results of elections. So that is one aspect. There's also the uh, the security dimension uh, of which we spoke when we speak about the vulnerability of countries uh, in terms of cyber attacks. Yeah, but there's also the issue of the, the connection to uh, spying, espionage is another uh, issue. That's another visible vulnerability. And some sectors will also uh, have more resources than others. So if we, you know, in, in job creation, persons uh, who work, like now automation will um, essentially mean that some people who have uh, employment that can be automated 
uh, they will not have uh, these opportunities. But an advantage it also, uh, to this is, is we're really going to have a reskilling of the workforce, a, a continued improvement of, of skills uh, within the workforce. So, you know, these are some of the important benefits and then some risk, uh, you know, including the, the control of the citizens. In some countries, countries are assigning a score to the behavior of citizens. And, and this is based on behavior that is observed without their consent. And this presents a security risk, uh, you know, in terms of privacy and uh, meaning how citizens can use uh, this to stay in power. Uh, thank you very, very much, Andrew. I think that's an excellent point that sort of the fourth industrial revolution gives governments unparalleled I'm control in many ways, access to information, and then I think increasingly ability to use that information for surveillance, for detention, potentially in the future for things like genetic engineering, um, to control, you know, lots of remote kinds of technology. So I think there are definitely some important security implications and troubling risks. Um, and I think I'd like to bring in Mohalehi, and then at the end we're gonna we're gonna go to to some of the recommendations you both have. But but Mohalehi, I'd like you to help us unpack further some of the fourth industrial revolution's strategic implications. Um, in your view, kind of from where you sit at the UN what are the primary security implications for African stakeholders that are likely to result from the spread of fourth industrial revolution technologies, building a little bit on what we just heard from, from Landry? And in particular, how do you see uh, the fourth industrial revolution changing the nature of the threat from violent actors like criminal groups, like violent extremists, and by potentially malicious nation state actors? Thank you so much, Nate and um, Landry. Wonderful to e meet you. Um, we should definitely know each other. Um, thank you to the African Center for inviting us. And as Nate has already said, my name is Mudehi Makumani, and I'm a researcher at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research based in Geneva. And our work is primarily looking into the implications for international peace and security. So sort of looking at um, that level of threshold. And what we're discussing today is a very, very interesting topic. And I agree with everything Landry has said so far um, with regards to the definite benefits um, that this brings and also the, the flagged risk that he's also raised around surveillance in, in Africa. Um, so from, from where I sit, there are a couple of primary security implications for a lot of countries um, with varying effect for, for African member states, of course. And one of them is, is that, at least from the research that we're doing, um, the technologies themselves are actually contributing in certain, in certain instances to escalating tensions um, where there are already existing political or geopolitical tensions. Um, and we see this um, in the case of certain technologies like AI enabled digital media fabrication or deep fakes, um, but um, which can be used to spread disinformation. And, and that's, that's something that we've, we've been looking at um, but the also related to this escalating tensions impact is also from a UN perspective, also then the role of technologies in UN work around mediation. And um, the UN is deploying technologies to, to also work in that space. But at the same time, those very same technologies can also be manipulated by by, by actors in that space, either the, the belligerents or even, or even state actors, and it, it becomes a bit murky there. Um, but there are also issues around ethics um, when it comes to, to the use of technologies in the maintenance of peace and security. And, and here primarily we're looking at um, artificial intelligence applications for military. And, and one of the things that, that we're seeing in our research is, 
is also reinforcing new bi reinforcing existing biases, gender and racial biases, but also creating new biases. So, you know, like, like we say, um, what, what happens online is actually a mirror of what happens offline. And we're also seeing this with regards to the application of, of, the, of these emerging technologies. And then I think at, at, a, at a higher, more strategic level is honestly a concern, both from the, from the emerging tech space, but also from the cyberspace um, around the concern that technologies and capabilities previously owned by state actors is, is now falling into the hands of non-state actors. And here, um, non-state actors really looking at those criminal networks, um, either switching that business model to more cyber dependent type of, type of um, malicious activities, um, but also the even violent extremist groups in, in certain, in certain yeah. cases, and, I, and I'll come back to that to elaborate a bit more. Um, but there's also now a trust deficit, right? Um, because of all the malicious ways in which the technologies can be used, um, the, the, there is a, a trust issues emerging within and between states with regards to what is real and what isn't. And, and there again, Nate, then I will, I'll then come back again to the non-state actors, which is, which is part of what really causes, causes this. Um, the fact that a lot of the emerging tech, or at least for AI, are uh, open source AI, the barrier to entry is extremely low. Um, and even, even in, in applications where, where developers have tried to limit it, we've seen evidence that it's also very easily replicated. And in the hands of, of non-state actors um, can really cause some serious destabilization. And these are a couple of things that that apply, yes, to a lot of member states, including developed countries, but also for, for developing countries a lot. And like I said, the, the deep fakes or synthetic media, we've seen a couple of examples of those in, in, in Africa, especially around elections. Um, but we but we've also but we've also seen um, on the other side of that the the then use of 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 certain of certain operations like internet shutdowns also in the context of of elections so it really blurs the line between who is who is using the technology for good and who is using the technology maliciously um, because it does impact it does impact a lot and then um, I also then just want to touch on on specifically military AI which is something that we've also been looking at so so a lot of of a lot of the emerging tech like I said has traditionally been for national security purposes and owned by the military and there's a lot of developments happening there but even there we are seeing like I said some ethical questions there around biases so you think about um, humanoid robotics and and some of the concerns that have been raised there around reinforcing gender biases and for for societies and states in Africa that is something that that needs to be taken into consideration and it runs the whole the whole gambit from developer develop deployment design and everything um, and then to just lastly to touch again on what Landry had raised around surveillance um, the dual purpose nature of these technologies is that it's also used for smart cities and safe city platforms and the lot, but at the same time, the concerns around data collection, privacy and sovereignty are still top of mind that and need to be considered more clearly. And I think those are, those are some of, of the ways in which we're looking at the issue and also that state non-state actor dynamic influences a lot of how we move in the space. Thank you very, very much for that excellent response. You know, you mentioned, I think, one of the perhaps most disruptive effects of the fourth industrial revolution is the capabilities in the hands of non-state actors like surveillance or advanced malware, 
like the use of, of drones, like use of AI for propaganda purposes and, and deep fakes and that sort of thing is being uh, a really significant shift that is likely only to accelerate over the coming years. So I imagine that's one challenge. I, I'm curious, what are the other challenges you see uh, governments and security sectors uh, having in managing the spread of the fourth industrial revolution technologies? And you know, it seems to me that cybersecurity is going to play a pretty important role in addressing some of these challenges. So, so if you could speak to both some of the challenges and and the role of cybersecurity in addressing them, uh, as your next question, that that'd be great. Oh, thanks, thanks, Nate. Um, the challenge is exactly what you said: managing um, the spread of the technologies, and it really depends on on which side of the table you sit, and generally on which day you sit in these discussions. Um, because what you will find in discussions, for instance, on, on, on artificial intelligence, especially in with regards to state use, is there, there is no way to control this. So some of the questions um, that states have to then um, ask and respond is, what, how do you manage it? Is it through prohibitions, regulations, or restrictions? And even then, what criteria um, will you use for, for prohibiting dual use technology? Um, how do you define then um, a weapon system in the case, in the case of states? But could there be other regulations or restrictions that can be imposed? And what is the impact of, on that on society as a whole? Um, what we do know is a couple of those that have been banned or currently have moratoriums have really been the type of, of technologies that can cause unnecessary suffering and are just inherently discriminate. Um, and that has been largely based on prohibitions under international humanitarian law, which is, which is very different from discussions around cybersecurity or international cybersecurity, which is more about, around responsible state behavior. So basically saying the technologies in themselves um, are not malicious. It is how states use the technology that can have that can have um, negative impact, and so in, in those discussions, there is no list of of technologies. It's just an acknowledgement that some emerging technologies can be used maliciously. Um, we probably have more advanced discussions on that around zero day vulnerabilities in the cyberspace. And like I said, in, in, the, in the AI or autonomous weapon system discussions, more around what is already prohibited um, under international humanitarian law. And, and the, the discussions are, are, really, are really in with regards to the technologies themselves on both sides at, at a, for lack of a better word, at, at really initial stages, um, because, because member states don't also want to close the door on the use of technologies. And, and the same way I would say in the cyber discussions, African states should be part of the discussion just so that they can also exercise their agency with regards to this. Should they decide 10 to 20 years from now to develop certain capabilities, they should at least have been at the table when the discussions were being made. And it's the same thing in the, in the weapon system discussions around artificial intelligence and, and other emerging tech. And, and, and so where the, the nexus comes in has really been around um, security for AI and not so much AI for, for cybersecurity. So, so here we've got, we've got a very interesting way in which the discussions are, are going in the artificial intelligence space, which is just when developing or acquiring new, new weapon systems based on emerging tech, 
um, physical security, but also appropriate non-physical safeguards, including cybersecurity against hacking or data spoofing should be taken into account. Um, but we don't have the inverse in the international cybersecurity discussions that talks about the use of AI for cybersecurity. And so, like I said, the very initial discussions, but of course, outside the UN and state-led initiatives, there are a lot more discussions around AI for cybersecurity, increasing the, the prevention, detection of, of those malicious actors. Thank you very, very much. So it, it strikes me that one of the main kind of stumbling blocks is that so much of this technology is, is so new that you're just not at the level where you can get any kind of broad international agreement on how to limit it. Because in order to drop kind of sensible treaties or regulations, you have to have some kind of understanding of what the capabilities, actors, activities involved. And in particular, especially when it comes to cybersecurity, to some extent when it comes to AI, you often have very technical discussions about the capabilities of the programs rather than, than how necessarily they're being used. And I think this is gonna, gonna change as we become more and more familiar with exactly what some of the broad implications of the technologies are. So um, I wanna get to Q&A and I would encourage our, our audience uh, if they do have questions, to begin asking them in the chat. But I do want to give both Landry and Moalehi just a couple minutes apiece to talk about what they see as some of the more uh, promising uh, ways in which government and security sector actors and also the private sector and, and civil society can work together to address some of the fourth industrial revolution's challenges. You know, I've often heard it said multiple times that, that in cyberspace, and this is probably true with other emerging technologies as well, um, criminals move at the speed of light and law enforcement moves at the speed of law. So um, how can government and security sector actors in partnership with non-governmental actors address the challenges you've identified and, and what kinds of policies, strategies, and international partnerships should governments be forging now to ensure they are not caught flat-footed by accelerated technological change. I'm going to give three minutes to each of you because we already have a lot of questions in the chat and then go to broader Q&A. So, Landry, let's, let's start with you. Thank Please you start. very much, Nate, for a question that is indeed very important. If we had more uh, more time and, and if we could, I, I would have gone back to the broader issue of strategy rather than cybersecurity. The first thing uh, uh, to get really to the specific topic of cybersecurity, the first thing to do is it's very important for states to really strengthen prevention capacities and response capacities to the vulnerabilities associated with cybersecurity. And this can be done by defining a very clear strategy uh, that needs to be a long-term strategy and, and also short term, but beyond defining a strategy, there is the issue of the resources needed and, and meaning also uh, financial resources because some governments will have strategies but will never have the resources to implement said strategies. So you need to have this resource, uh, this strategy in the uh, short and long term and also the deployment of resources uh, and a, a national level coordination of, of key actors, and that's extremely important. The encouraging societal uh, responsibility, accountability, it's not just a question of the state, it's also civil society, it's, it's uh, all aspects of society. So really promoting uh, collective accountability, it's in that reinforces the trust of the citizens towards this digital world uh, towards the fourth industrial re revolution in general. Now, another point is really also to increase, you, we need to raise awareness among citizens um, and other actors uh, regarding the risk associated with cybersecurity. And we need to offer training programs that will enable them to more quickly 
respond uh, to the risk associated with cybersecurity. There are currently several programs in existence. The African Union with its Convention on Cybersecurity and the Protection of Private Data, the, the Malibu Convention. Uh, you know, this uh, was presented in 2011, but was only adopted in 2014. This may be one of the tools that could be used in a more substantial manner, because up to now, only a limited number of African countries, uh, when I last checked, uh, I think it was less than 10 African countries that had actually validated a plan. I think Angola, Guinea, uh, Mauritius, Namibia, Senegal, and, and Rwanda. And so it is very important to ensure that these countries, that they not only, no, actually 14 countries um, signed the convention, but I think it was only eight that ratified it. Even the name has changed, even if the number has changed since the last check, it hasn't been a significant change. Now there's the uh, AU cybersecurity uh, expert group that is essentially the experts of, of the AU on this topic that can truly be deployed at, on the continental level, at the uh, sub-region level, at the local level to really improve the implementation of these measures to face uh, these risks, uh, these cybersecurity risks. There are also human uh, challenges and technological challenges. So this is really uh, something that we must do to, to respond to these cybersecurity risks. We, we must have this continental approach, this sub-regional approach, as well as a national um, approach, um, as well as with the cyber emergency response teams. So there are several tools that can be used to, to reinforce, to strengthen capacities. And we must also strengthen infrastructures, improve infrastructures, and because these will enable governments to improve their security. Now, intention is also extremely important. Um, cybersecurity improvement measures must be done in a very rigorous, planned manner. There must be an overall commitment from several stakeholders at various levels, be it at the level of the governments, civil society, businesses. This is really a collective responsibility. The vulnerability of a sector or certain actors also involves the vulnerability on a, in a broader sense of the entirety of the, the national ecosystem. So I will conclude here by listing very rapidly more overarching items, because cybersecurity is closely linked to strategy, to an, a more overall strategy for, for this fourth industrial revolution. Every state must have a coherent, um, integrated strategy, and they must also support the adoption of this agile governance principles that make it make a quick response possible when threats appear. So you have governance, you have strategy, you have also have the issue of the implementation of the existing initiatives, because there are a lot of initiatives, but they're not sufficiently put into application. Then there's this issue of collaboration with uh, stakeholders, be they national or international. And then we must also build secure infrastructure and be they physical or digital infrastructures. Now, also without uh, the access to technologies that will enable the securing of these infrastructures, uh, then you know we would have an issue. So we re this really pertains to uh, human capacity. Do we have sufficient a sufficient number of cybersecurity experts? I, I really think there's a, a lack, a shortage of uh, in the sector of, of a sufficient number of cyber experts. So you have a very specific cybersecurity strategy that needs to be followed, and 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 I think my colleague Moliehi, who has really uh, given a fabulous response about this, can can go further on this topic. But then you have also this overall strategy. Uh, that is important because it is, these are not disconnected. 
Thank you very, very much, Landry. Yes, absolutely. Started at a national level with strategies and policies, but also realized there is a crucial international dimension to dealing with emerging technology. Let's bring in uh, Yumo Dehi, and then we have a bunch of questions I'm looking forward to getting to. Okay. Um, thanks, Nate. And again, I agree with everything Landry has said, and exactly the inverse, um, because he's covered the cyber staff. Um, even in, in the emerging tech space, um, there are some, there is going to be a workforce shortage. Um, and so that's something that, that governments should also really be looking into. Um, the, the evolving business model around, around, um, around malicious, malicious use around AI and how it can scale up common, common challenges that we have is that those networks are eventually going to become as sophisticated and actually take the AI um, capacities that are used in governments and, and in other sectors um, to sort of just scale that, that malicious area. Um, but I also wanted to touch on, for instance, when Landry was talking about about the policies and the good initiatives that, that we've got at a sub-regional and regional level in Africa. And I'm thinking the smart Africa type of initiatives where you've got these flagship projects being led by countries, you've got big data by the Republic of, of Rwanda, you've got AI um, flagship country being South Africa, you've got smart cities um, and smart energy, Republic of Rwanda. All these type of flagship um, projects, that's where, that's where the, the policies should, should also be developing within that multi-stakeholder model, um, where, where you're talking to private sector, academia, think tanks, um, as well as, as researchers in this space. And, and one thing that we've also learned um, in, in, in cyber, and I think it also applies to emerging tech, is there are really good examples of public-private partnerships um, that, can, that can be emulated. Because sometimes the problem is member states don't know how to get into these partnerships or collaborative efforts where they are getting what they need from the private sector and continuing and continuing on that end with the business of being governments. Um, but there are some really interesting models that exist in the, in the human rights space. For instance, we've seen really good collaboration between countries and entities like the ICRC. We've seen good collaboration between countries and the International Chamber of Commerce um, with, with matching. We've seen good good um, partnerships between the capacity building sort of entities with countries really matching the needs of countries in these different spaces. And so I think there's also a lot that can be done in that space. Um, but also as a transparency measure and a confidence building measure, um, sharing what kind of policies countries are developing. We know, we know, um, we, we, we know and we can see the AI policies, for instance, coming out of the EU, and we can see the central, the central features of those human machine interface and the lot. I think there's also a lot to say for being that transparent with, with policies around these kind of issues. And it would also be good to see what African countries are also thinking around these policies and to also share these policies. We've got the cyber policies, UNIDIR hosts a cyber policy portal, and you can see the different policies that countries around the world um, are developing on cyber. It will soon be launching an, an AI policy portal. There are already some existing AI portals. I think the OSCE already has one. Um, those kind of transparency measures, I also think go a long way in terms of, of improving the entire ecosystem. Thanks for sharing the link. Yeah, no, thank you very, very much. Yeah, so I, I highly encourage folks to check out the Cyber Policy Portal link. It's a really great resource if your country is looking for to, to, to start some kind of cyber-related policy. Um, I, would, I would definitely start there because you can basically see most of the world's uh, published cybersecurity policies, strategies at this link. I personally have found it to be a very, very useful resource. Um, so now let's let's get to some of the questions. We have a lot of a very very interesting and I think some very very challenging questions. So I want to start off with with two. Um, 
One, uh, we heard from a member of the audience that like you, Modehi, uh, uh, to talk a little bit more about bias in AI and particularly a gender bias in, in military deployment of, of AI. Um, I think that actually is a really, really important point. So it would be good to be elaborate a little bit on why it's biased, why this is a security issue, and maybe a little bit about what to do about it. And um, there's also question. another very interesting question for our colleague Landry. It says, hello, Landry. How is it that the uh, technological deployments of France and Europe has not had any impact in strengthening security in the Sahel? I think that's an interesting question because, you know, you have this technological, these technological powers that are trying to uh, work in the Sahel, and and yet. Uh, there, there's been such a, a problems with the security situation there. I, I'd really like to hear your opinion on this. We're going, we'll begin with you and then we'll go to Moliehi. Thank you so much, Nate. And thank you for this question. This is a, a very important question. So the response may be more direct actually. Uh, although uh, you could elaborate longer on it, but the, the question, it's not just a technological question or issue. You know, to deal with security issues in terms of Sahel, there are a lot of security, there are a lot of stakes. There's an economic stake, there's, a, there's security, there's develop, there's, there, there's a nexus between uh, climate change that impacts the, the various the ways of life in the region. You have the issue of governance, the quality of the governance that is present, but the human question remains extremely important. That's that I really want to underline that. Now, in terms of the technological deployment in the Sahel region by Europe and, and by France, there's also In the question, an issue of availability of resources, but also the strength of the intervention. I think the resources were not necessarily deployed by France or the other partners. They, they, in you know, they support the local governments, but they do not take the place of these local governments. Now, even if the level of intervention was incredibly strong. The, it's the question, the human question nevertheless remains important. Therefore, collaboration, negotiation with the various actors is really something that without which the technologies cannot win the situation. You have to win the hearts and minds. It's not just a, a question of strength, because even with the use of technology, the, the question of um, war law and uh, wartime law and human rights, it, it, you know, this cannot be done in such a way that you don't respect human rights. So, you know, if we think about human rights, if we are democratic, if we think about the resources that are available, uh, you know, for France or for the US, I mean, you know, with the support that was provided in the Lake Chad region, but are these resources really uh, matched up to the stakes? Uh, of these conflicts. And I don't think that's necessarily uh, the case. And there's also the issue of tactics uh, that is also important. So technology in and of itself cannot solve all problems. Great, excellent response. I think that, uh, you know, oftentimes we see technology as a silver bullet when it's not. And really when strategy matters just as much as technology does. And I think to, to Landry's point, when it comes to dealing with the conflict in this hell, I, I argue you need a more a population centric strategy and potentially a different kind of kit. I mean, one of the ways in which technology is transforming conflict is we're relying more and more on cheap, easily replicable platforms that emphasize mobility, intelligence collection and gathering. And, and honestly, where most of the technological innovation has gone over the past 20 years, especially by more technology dependent platforms, we're still emphasizing very complicated and exquisite 
um, um, and expensive platforms. I don't necessarily think those are suited for the counterinsurgency challenges in the Sahel. If you're interested in this topic, I just linked a recent Africa Center security brief that talked about uh, talks about strengthening Sahelian counterinsurgency strategy. It gets to the, a lot of the points that, that Dr. Signe just mentioned. It will soon be available in, in French and, and Portuguese. Modehi, let's go over to you to, to, to answer the question about uh, bias in artificial intelligence. Yeah, um, thanks, Nate, and and thanks for for the question. So we we Unidir actually has a really interesting publication on this, um, and and you can look into it a bit more. But basically, what what the the concern really is is number one. Let me start with a caveat. Of course, gender norms are not constant, um, and they are they vary according to to cultures, but. If AI is, is to be seen as replicating human intelligence, um, what, what the concern in military application is, is then that understanding of human intelligence should, should not be biased against women, but should really include all genders. We already know that just based on on even civilian application, voice recognition, image detection, and machine translation, um, the AI has, has been found to recognize men at higher rates than women. Um, and so this, this then extends beyond just AI for, for intelligence or surveillance or reconnaissance, but it also then impacts what happens on, on the battlefield. And, and the one way in which in which this can be addressed is really just a more gender-based approach to the human-machine interaction is needed. And so including more, more women or even, or even people of different orientations when those algorithms and the data sets are being compiled is one way in which we think that can be improved. Um, but of course, there are other biases that have also been found, including racial. And so um, even when you look at um, the robotics, um, the, the military robotic soldier has, has, has very masculine attributes to them. Um, and, and the idea there to mainstream the gender is to also include um, those more womanly attributes if, if there's such a thing, but it's really about including everyone at the design, the development phase, the deployment, as well as in building those human machine interface policies at the military level, so that those military applications don't then just mirror or replicate biases that already exist within societies and don't transform as societies transform. So a really, a really um, dynamic process is is what we think should be should be addressed when it comes to the military application as well. Thanks, Nate. Thank you very, very much. Um, so I think we have a few more questions. So I'll, I'll pose them to each of you and then we'll wrap up. So one question we have is, how can member states best employ AI strategies to ensure, to prevent the potential escalation of tensions, um, let's say both within and among African states? Um, so, so, so AI is a potential uh, uh, source of escalation and how to, how to limit it is one question. Um, another, I think, really, really important question is, so um, some studies have shown a link between economic growth and technological development and climate change. So how might the fourth industrial revolution contribute to climate change and how can it maybe be a way of addressing climate change? I think that's a good question. And then, and then finally, we have a couple of questions related to the malicious use of poor AR technologies like AI, like drones by, by non-state actors and um, how specifically how states can protect themselves. So how can states kind of address the use of AI by or, or other 4IR technologies by extremist groups and specifically how might they adapt their current counterterrorism strategies to do so, which I know is a big topic of conversation, especially among the African Union and other RECs, Rex, uh, today. So uh, why don't we um, start with you, Modehi? We'll end on Landry, and then we will we will um, finish up the webinar. So any any of those three questions, feel free to feel free to, to answer. 
Um, thanks, Nate. I'll, I'll actually start with the last one and around non-state use of, of, of the technologies. And to say what, what we are hearing from member states, at least at the, at the UN discussions in the context of the international global governance is, although it is a concern that, that there are some technologies in the hands of non-state actors, um, there isn't any tangible um, or, or quantifiable sort of evidence that member states are willing to share around, around the use of, of these technologies by non-state actors. Um, and so the ones that we know of a lot more are, like you said, the, the use of drones um, or unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, and then in, in the cyberspace, it's really around the, the use of those zero day vulnerabilities and then rather encouraging um, disclosure of vulnerabilities and, and reducing stockpiling, um, which was traditionally done by, by state actors, but falls into the wrong hands and you've got an issue. So, so as much as there is a concern, um, member states are also not being very open around, around the use of, of these tools by non-state actors which then makes it furthermore difficult to really sort of set up parameters for, for non-state use. So that's, that's just on, on that end. And then I was also, um, also intrigued by, by the first question also around, around policies. And I think it's something that Landry touched on, which is, um, which is looking at, at what does exist. There's a lot of best practice and good practices that are emerging in, in the policy spaces around, around emerging tech and, and cybersecurity. And I think that's also a really good way to start to see what is happening a lot of the times. People say um, African member states can leapfrog and so don't make the same mistakes as, as other countries have done, but learn from those mistakes. And then, and actually put in policies that I think Landry also touched on this holistic look that looks at, at the entire ecosystem and not just national security or economies or, or you know, the other different sectors. Um, that will be my contribution. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Landry, over to you for the final word. Thank you so much. So I agree with everything that Molieri has said, brilliant uh, comments. So I don't have much to add to it, but on the question of the climate change and the fourth industrial revolution, it is important to in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, it, it brings tools, whether it's at the level of research or innovations or new technologies or solutions. There are several configurations that allow uh, solutions to the climate issue. Artificial intelligence, for example, allows us to anticipate forest fires, natural forest fires, and therefore to intervene early to prevent the ravages of these fires, whether it's ravages to the forest or to farmland. And so that is one of the stakes. Uh, and what are the capacities of local governments to obtain the qualified uh, persons, human resources and qualified labor to, to implement these policies because the problem is not only the type of policies that are decided upon and developed by the leaders, but also can they be implemented? So, and can they be well defined? Can they be uh, adopted? At what point are they put into effect? Uh, and what are the results? So that, so there are the questions of what are the short term, medium term, long term strategies? And how can the governments identify uh, 
uh, I've already uh, written upon it uh, about climate change in Africa, and I, I've written a paper, two, two papers on it that will be uh, published soon, one on uh, climate change uh, and the conflicts and security in the Sahel region. And you can find that on the Brookings Institution website. And there is another one that will soon come be published. What are the strategies to face to confront these uh, changes? And what are the strategies that have been identified that are linked to the fourth industrial revolution? So we're talking about clean tech. We're talking about smart agriculture. We're speaking of applications that address the stakes that uh, are facing the world, that the challenges facing the world. So I think we have artificial intelligence that is used to anticipate whether it's forest fires or to anticipate levels of, of uh, fertilizer needed or anticipate the quality of the soil vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, expected precipitation rainfall so these are important elements but we also have the issue of drones that can be used to have a better surveillance of an area to better protect an area to better pro identify uh, areas that are at risk in certain regions uh, for example, reforestation as well. So the fourth industrial revolution really is a question of how will the leaders focus uh, on human-centered technologies, technologies that, that put the human being at the center of the concerns uh, during their uh, time in office. So there are some ex solutions that already exist in the world, but the question is the following, do African leaders, can they have technological uh, strategic uh, units that in place, or can these be well identified? There, there, uh, what is the link on the local level? And can this be, can this be measured? So there is a tr proper transfer of technology to local areas to to respond to uh, climate questions, for example. And this uh, technological transfer, can it be done? Can it be done in a manner to uh, support and encourage innovation? So, so it's a question of uh, adaptation to adaptation to these technologies of the fourth industrial revolution some of these exist already so it is a stage uh, that we it's a future stage that we can uh, uh use in the future thank you thank you very very much for that you know excellent intervention and, and a real thank you on behalf of the anisa africa center to all our alumni and colleagues and friends for sharing their insights today. I think that, that uh, you know, Landry's answer about really um, fourth industrial revolution being a potential problem, but also a potential solution to climate change, right? Kind of encapsulates a lot about the importance and significance of emerging technology and fourth industrial revolution technologies going forward. And, and I think kind of two main conclusions for me that come out of this conversation that I, I'd like to kind of highlight for all is first, I think it's important for African countries to get a little more engaged on matters of not only cybersecurity, but emerging technology writ large. Most countries don't have national strategies or policies in place. Most countries are not really that engaged in discussions at the UN about you know, regulating lethal autonomous weapons use or shaping norms of state behavior in cyberspace. Even though these, these debates today are going to probably shape state behavior for years to come and also significantly affect the world's ability to address the threat posed by non-state violent actors which are you know using these technologies in ways that truly you know span borders i mean we live in a world where somebody can you know take a basically free gpt3 algorithm as as Mode, he was saying you know train it in spreading disinformation and put that bot to work basically 
anywhere in the world. And, and so a, a, a threat of that scale uh, requires truly international cooperation to address. And it begins, I think, by each of you kind of participating in your home countries, helping set strategies, policies, and guidelines, and participating in the international debate about how to use these technologies. And I think one of the things I've learned is that it's especially important for policymakers like you to be participating because, you know, Africa actually has a lot going for it, a very youthful population, some tremendous centers of technological innovation across the continent. But, but in my experience, it's not so much policymakers as technical experts who are participating in a lot of these really, really important debates. We need strategic thinkers, we need policymakers. And I, I hope that, that, that if, as I said at the very beginning of this conversation, if there's one thing you take away from this webinar, it's, it's convinced you of the importance of these emerging technologies for the future of African security. And you know, also as, as, a, as above all a strategic opportunity to, I think as both Landry and Modehi has, has emphasized, to, to put a human centric approach to technological change um, now and in the future. And, and I think if, if our African governments and leaders and security sector colleagues do that, you know, not only will they be able to mitigate a lot of the threats we've talked about today, but they'll really put the African continent in an excellent position going forward when it comes to using technology as, in, as, as a lever for global influence. So thank you so much. And again, have, have, a, have a great uh, uh, rest of the week. And, and hopefully this is the, the beginning of a continued series of conversations about uh, the threats posed by the fourth industrial revolution and how we might work together to address them.